Hello, and welcome to another episode of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and you've got a treat uh, <laughs> today because this is our Christmas special, History's Most Amazing Christmas Special. <laughs> Yeah, it certainly will be amazing. We've got some interesting stories to tell you. A little, so it's gonna the format's gonna be a little bit different than it usually is. Uh, we're gonna do three short stories from history. Three three little interesting stories that we thought were interesting. Um, I just said interesting twice, but you know, because <laughs> they're so interesting. They're so interesting. Um, uh, yeah, they're like little nuggets, little well that we say kind of stocking fillers. Yeah, these are kind of mini gifts that are um, going to brighten up your Christmas. Indeed. Now, you've got, uh, you've got one for us here, um, and this is, this is one that I remembered hearing about a while ago, and I have no idea... I, I have no idea the context. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, it is, it is uh, quite a tricky question for historians to work out the context as well. Diving straight into it, um, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the medieval, I want to say obsession, or at least interest in, um, dog heads. <laughs> dog heads appear in a lot of weird literature and illustrations throughout history. Absolutely. I mean, um, from kind of the ancient world through to... Uh, medieval times there was a generally kind of a accepted notion that somewhere on the planet lived a race of uh, dog-headed men, men who well, humans who had the heads of dogs who barked to communicate um, but who in all other aspects resembled uh, human beings they wore clothes, they lived in like settlements that we would recognise as human and um they appear even like in uh, medieval maps of the world um, with kind of often kind of western medieval maps. The west is okay it looks a bit odd shape yeah. but um, kind of the cities and nations that we know exist are on the map and then the further and further you get away you get more and more weird and wonderful creatures on this map Um <laughs> I mean, there's uh, a race of people with one giant foot that they use as an umbrella. Um, there's things like unicorns and mermaids that are kind of still hold some popular resonance. <coughs> Not that people necessarily believe it, but you know, we would recognise them. I, I know there's one of the most... th there's one with a man with who has just his face on his chest. He's headless, yeah, but he has yeah, a face yeah. on his chest. Um, they were they were um, quite popular as well, and. My favourite is the dog heads, uh, because they raise loads of um, well, interesting questions, shall we say? Mm. Um, because dog heads were like these other kind of weird and wonderful creatures, generally thought to exist, um, to the extent that in the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, Saint Christopher. Um, who's, you know, one of the better-known saints, I would say, was um, a doghead um, <laughs> who'd converted to Christianity. And I believe when he did so, God gave him the ability to talk. So you see <laughs> religious icons of, um, you know, saint, holy saint, with the head of a dog. <laughs> how, how did this... this, this mythology spread I, I think um, it had always existed in kind of well always existed got to have started somewhere I think yeah. the truth is we're not quite sure where um, but in kind of ancient literature um, kind of Greece <sighs> Egyptians even kind of potentially in, in, in Roman times this was kind of a, a trope Mm. Uh, or a creature that you know was in ancient literature. Um, they lived somewhere else. The um, historian 
Robert Bartler has said it's in the very nature of dog heads to be somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter so, where, it's just somewhere that isn't here. Exactly, so they might have lived in India or Africa or the Far East or who knows, but it's always just some distant location. So that, you know, the lack of eyewitness accounts makes sense <laughs> at that time because, of course, no one's been over there. Um, although, of course, Marco Polo went over there. He explored yeah. the, uh, the Eastern... In, in the written account of his stories, I don't believe he wrote it himself, but in the written account, the contemporary written account of the stories he used to tell, he did say that there was dog heads living out in the Far East. Um, he described them as... Um, growing spices um, <laughs> spicy in every other respect they were like a mastiff alright so let, let's let's be real here this obviously didn't exist why did he feel the need to, well maybe, again maybe not him but you know the people who were recording mm -hmm. his adventures why, why, why did they feel the need to, to, to lie what I, I would I mean in a way who knows but yeah. what I would love to think is that um, you know he tells the stories of the of this unknown world in the Far East to a Western audience, and people are expecting dog heads. Yeah, it, I guess you're right. It's a it's selling a point. Pleaser. Yeah, it's like I come from from far off lands where you've always heard of these mythical creatures and mythical men. Well, guess what? The rumors are true, and that will get books selling like hotcakes. And I think <laughs> maybe I would love to imagine as well that, you know, he's going through his stories, and, uh, I mean, we're totally imagining a scenario here <laughs> that wouldn't ever exist in medieval times, but his publisher <laughs> sitting there like, well, um, have you got any dog head stories? And he's sitting there thinking, I didn't meet any dog heads. Um, mm -hmm. And the publisher's saying, well, come on, we need some doghead material, or people aren't going to believe you've actually been there. <laughs> uh, and he's just like, yeah, 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 doghead, yeah, I met dogheads, yeah, definitely. What I think is fascinating about this um, is the extent to which, um, because it was just accepted fact, even though there was no eyewitnesses, um, the fact that serious kind of scholars and religious people took the issue of dogheads and kind of tried to apply rational and logical thought to it. Um, I mean, it's very easy for us to just think um, medieval people were stupid. Um, yeah. That's why they believed these stupid things that we know to be ridiculous. But, you know, they only existed... 800, 1,000 years ago, the human evolution has not changed since then. They were exactly the same, mm -hmm. you know, genetically uh, to us. So they had the same levels of intelligence as us. It's just that the amount and the availability of human knowledge was so much less that they couldn't um, kind of pick the truth from the kind of myths yeah, and, and when this is like concentrated so much and and just taught as fact, then of course they're going to believe it. Yeah, I mean, you think about you know we believe a huge number of things that we've never physically seen ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of us have never seen, say, a germ. Yeah. Um, but we believe perfectly to be completely rock solid fact that germs exist and they get into you and you make you ill. Mm. Um, now, obviously the scientific stuff to back that up we trust that the science is true mm. we haven't done it ourselves um, and these people trusted that the kind of stories and scholars that they read were true mm. um, so I want to give one example that kind of really shows us <laughs> the extent to which Doghead had um, penetrated the medieval mind and uh, engaged kind of intelligent thinkers it's we throw ourselves back to the ninth century mm. in England, and for those people, um, Scandinavia, modern day Norway, Sweden, mm. etc., was a kind of wild and distant and alien world because this was where the pagan Vikings 
were from. So a Christian missionary is about to head off on a dangerous journey to Scandinavia, unknown, unmapped part of the world. And he writes to a leading scholar of the age, a guy called Rotramnus. And he is asking for advice, and one of the things he asks is, what should you believe about the dog heads? Are they descended from Adam's stock, or do they have the souls of animals? Because he assumed, potentially, he wanted to be safe, uh, he could meet dog heads in Scandinavia. Yeah. Now, as a Christian missionary, it's his duty to obviously convert everyone he comes across or do his best to convert yeah. them to Christianity. But there's no point in convert, uh, trying to convert an animal, right? Yeah, animals don't have souls according to Christian doctrine. You, you don't preach to um, yeah. a dog. So he was really concerned like, if I meet dog heads, should I be trying to convert them to Christianity? Or are they animals? And Retramnus writes uh, a really kind of detailed and rational and logical reply. He kind of balanced up what we'd say now probably be the pros and cons. Um, for dog heads, are they human or not? So he said, hmm, on the one hand, the shape of their heads and their barking that is evidence against but on the other hand he said well what do we know about them they live in villages they keep domesticated animals mm. they farm they live in a seemingly like ordered society and what he thought was most important piece of evidence you can see his rational, logical mind working here, was that they wore clothes. Mm. Which must be a sign of decency. Yeah. He wrote, I do not see how this could be if they had an animal and not a rational soul. For no one can blush at indecency <laughs> unless they have a certain recognition of decency. Dogheads must know right from wrong they must know it's indecent to walk around naked. So they must be human. An animal doesn't know that. It's hard to argue with that logic. It's excellent logic. Yeah. He said, um, to conclude, he said, a group of moral, rational beings living in a society bound by laws, this is humanity, not mere animality. <laughs> So when he did go to Scandinavia uh, and came back, did did he report any sightings of dogheads? I'm presuming not. Yeah. Um, because, of course, dogheads are always somewhere else. Yes. If he started talking to dogheads with the Scandinavians, I'm sure they would have said, no, no, they're off in the, the Russian steppes. <laughs> and then if you went to the Russian steppes, they'd say, no, no, they're, uh, they're in Mongolia. So, yes, an amazing... I mean, I encourage you to go on Google and just to Google dog heads and just go on images. In fact, I oh, want yeah. the the picture for this episode to be a dog head, preferably a, a religious icon of I, a dog head. I, I was thinking that, yeah, that's what I was thinking, because it, it, it really needs to be seen to be believed. Um, Some of the drawings are fantastic. You know, you've got dog heads as soldiers, dog heads, you know, trading and bartering. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's one that I saw which uh, has all the the different ones that we talked about earlier together in one one illustration. There's the man with using the foot as the umbrella. There's the man with the chest with his face on it, and then there's a dog head, and then there's like a, one other one which I can't remember. But it's so it's so amazing seeing all these things together at once, and they're accepted as fact. It was probably just you know your standard scene out in the Far East at that yeah. time. Yep. Ah, uh, dog heads. Love them. Excellent. Now you've also you you have another story for us, don't you? Yeah, I'm I'm sticking with the kind of medieval um, theme for a little bit, mm. um, and we're going to go to. Um, the Byzantine Empire, which featured heavily in our 
uh, was it our last episode? It was our last episode, episode yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, a number of really bizarre religious practices. This is Christmas. It's, uh, you know, essentially a religious festival yeah. still. So um, I wanted to talk about some um, Christian practices that I think our listeners are going to find interesting yeah uh, maybe slightly amusing um certainly we would consider them to be uh old-fashioned mm. and um well i'll just get into it first of all there was a, a real trend <laughs> of saints in the kind of um late antique world the kind of uh, immediate post western roman empire um, era of um, stylite monks mm. or uh, saints and these were kind of holy men who would live on the top of columns right on pillars so they would live on the top of these yep it's as simple as that it's like a David Blaine stunt <laughs> um, a flagpole sitter they would live on the top of a pillar to be well the old things around monasticism is separate yourself from the secular world mm. dedicate your life to god without any distractions and this was just taking it to the next level literally um mm. so the most famous one was a guy called um, simeon who lived on top of a pillar uh near Aleppo for 40 years apparently uh, there's a wonderful um, the images of these guys are incredible um, you know they just kind of have these at the top of a pillar a little little fence and they're going to sit in there look into the heavens um, so um, reportedly um Simeon, while he was up there for his 40 years, he um, he would pretty much constantly be praying. Apparently he lost his eyesight three times. Um, this is, we think, maybe due to malnutrition. Yeah. Um, well, I was, I was going to ask, did he eat when, when he was up there? I mean, I, I would assume so. I mean, you'd have to, right? Yeah, I mean, I think they um, would... They basically communities, religious communities sprang up at the base of these pillars. Right. Of people come in to, to marvel at them, to worship with them, to try and learn some of their wisdom. Um so I presume they would have supplied them with the, the bare essentials. Um one of the St. Simeon in his long stay up the top of this pillar is said to have suffered from a large number of obviously health complaints. Mm as you would um, reportedly um, for nine months he had boils on one of his feet Oof. that were oozing pus uh -huh. and that um, this trickled down the pillar <sighs> and that all his visitors um, had to <laughs> had to take measures to block out the smell oh. so potent was the smell oh. of the ooze um, oh. reportedly people um, smeared cedar resin under their noses <laughs> when they went to see him um, apparently the reason that Simeon did it in the first place was to get rid of all the um, the crowds that were pestering him because he was this holy man um Right, and he, so he just wanted to get away from. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this religious community that pops up around him, he's like, "No, I don't want this here. Have, have pus." <laughs> well, yeah, maybe the pus was an effort to drive away. Uh, that's, what, that's what I was thinking. That's what <laughs> I was thinking. He he knew how bad it was. He's like, "No, nah, I don't want this." <laughs> um. But yeah, basically his model was um, copied by other people who wanted to be, um, you know, just as holy and as him. And apparently there are a total of 124 
mm. Stylite Saints. Uh, one of them called St. Daniel, St. Daniel the Stylite, um, lived on top of a pillar um, near Constantinople. And during a storm, the wind blew away his clothes. Oh. And he remained at the top of the pillar naked, um, exposed, you know, to the elements, the rain mm. and the winds, um, to such an extent that his long hair and beard, you know, imagine a monk yeah. um, or a hermit, in the, were glued to his skin by icicles. Oh. Um, it was so cold. Um, his disciples, you know, the people at the bottom of his pillar, um, had to basically get a load of warm water and pour it over him mm. um, to defrost him. <laughs> Um, he says, apparently, according to um, the life of St. Daniel, um, he claimed that he'd slept through the whole ordeal um, and that uh, he'd been dreaming of sleeping on a lovely uh, couch with warm blankets <laughs> and so hadn't felt the cold at all. That sounds like late-stage hypothermia to me. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe he's, he's hallucinating. <laughs> That's what I think. I, I think that he was uh, he was passed out from the cold, and uh, <laughs> they, they say that when you're uh, you're suffering from late stage hypothermia, you feel nice and warm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like he may have been in some serious danger there. <laughs> but what's fascinating is this is just one of a of a selection of quite bizarre um, kind of religious trends. Mm in the Byzantine Empire um, there was a group called the grazers who lived in the wild and ate from the earth they didn't prepare meals um, mm. there was a hermit who grazed with antelopes um, there were some who wore incredibly heavy chains um, or kind of they were called iron wearing uh, it was the practice of they would um deliberately kind of wear these huge iron collars with heavy chains draped down to weigh them down apparently um, people lived like that for decades mm -hmm. um, all to kind of separate yourself out from society, get closer to God, remove all the kind of um, remove all the, the stuff in the way of from secular life and just make yourself kind of focus on worship it sounds like some sort of like um, like penance you know yeah exactly um, now my favourite of these are the so called uh, saloi or the holy fools um, saints who either it's up to, to your interpretation but they were either mad um, or they there is a strain of thought that they deliberately rejected the prestige they were getting, a bit like the Stylites mm. um, as holy men by um, kind of doing the exact opposite, acting like they were mad mm. in order to stop people following them around, but also to show um, how holy they were um, and how dedicated to Christ they were willing to make themselves outcasts with their behavior um so <laughs> um St. Simeon of Edessa I believe he is a different Simeon but he you know he might be the same yeah. one I might be mistaken um he entered the city of Edessa um pulling behind him the a dead dog <laughs> um he went to a church service and started throwing nuts at the candles <laughs> um, <laughs> and then people started abusing him and having a go at him so he went to the pulpit um, and started throwing nuts at ladies in the church <laughs> <laughs> and this was all to kind of reject the social prestige <laughs> for being a holy man um, basically they wanted to conceal the fact they were these holy miracle workers by acting like insane outcasts. Uh, 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 there's so many layers to this. <laughs> I, I love that. 
Um, let me read a little quote from a religious text called The Ladder to Heaven about possibly explaining why these people did it. If the height of vanity is pretending to have virtues that you do not in fact have in order to be praised for them, then the height of humility humility must be to pretend you have vices that you do not have in order to be regarded as lesser than you are. <laughs> So let me reel off a list of some of the things some of these holy fools went to in order to conceal, in order to, to make people think they had vices they didn't have. The height of humility. This is the height of humility. Mm. Defecating in public. Okay. Entering the women's baths. Throwing small stones at jugglers while they're performing. <laughs> Dragging yourself along on your buttocks rather than walking. <laughs> Right. Sticking your foot out to trip people in the street. <laughs> and Simeon apparently used to um, get a whip and start whipping like columns, pillars, mm. ordering them, remain standing! <laughs> whipping them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I just like to imagine this guy enters town, dragging a dog behind him, and yeah. is dead. Throwing nuts at women. Throwing and... nuts in the church, yeah. whips the pillars, remains standing, <laughs> trips people up, throws stones at jugglers, <laughs> defecates in public, <laughs> all to show how humil how is the level of humility that he has. Well, I'm sure it worked. I'm sure it it drove people away. Um, and that's what he wanted. Although the question that I have is, is why enter town in the first place? <laughs> yeah, he's rejecting the kind of hermit approach. Yeah. Or the pillar approach. <laughs> Maybe he thought that was just, that's been done. Yeah. He, he thought anyone can go into a cave. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go throw nuts at people. So yeah, that is some bizarre Byzantine religious practices. I love it. I absolutely love it. I I, I think my favorite is the nuts. I, I just love the <laughs> idea. Going into a church, throwing nuts. I wonder what kind of nuts they were. It's like what an antisocial <laughs> person would do at the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> do you think he you think he booed the pastor like a guy in a movie theater would do? <laughs> This movie sucks. It walks out. <laughs> I've had enough. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> oh, well, we've got one more story for you. One more story. And, uh, well, it you know it it it's Christmas, it's the holidays, and this is our most Christmassy stock. Yeah, I feel like this, one. this is the most Christmassy one. Now, when you think of when you think of Christmas, you think of a Christmas tree, you think of garland and presents, but you also think of eggnog. Yeah, and I tell you what, in 1826, a lot of boys at West Point Military Academy had eggnog on the mind. Well, they would do. It's Christmas. Yeah, exactly. However, there is a problem. Because at West Point, alcohol is uh, is banned. Because it's a military academy. It makes sense. Right. And, I mean, who wants to have eggnog without a little bit of, you know, a little bit of spirits? Well, evidently not a lot of people at West Point. There, <laughs> in, in 1826... There was something called the Eggnog Riot. Now... Okay. I'm I, intrigued already. As a side note, by the way, I should point out... Um, are you familiar with Jefferson Davis, the uh, Confederate States of America president? Right. He was present at the Eggnog Riot. I'm sure he would have been a calming influence. Oh, absolutely. He certainly would have like, rebelled or anything. No, Wouldn't no. Wouldn't have done that. Not at all. So I'll give you a rundown on basically how the uh, the events unfolded. Um, it takes place over the uh, 
of the 24th and 25th, obviously, but a few days before, there's uh, there's three men who go to a tavern uh, somewhere near West Point called Martin's Tavern, and they uh, they're they get into a fight with the proprietors of this tavern in order to get whiskey to bring back to West Point. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course you do. Yeah. You don't just buy it. No, you Get no. into a fight. They, 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 steal it. they got into a fight. I don't know the, the ins and outs, but I assume that probably the tavern owner was like, alright, you're three cadets. You, you, you can't have this. I, I know what you're going to do with it. It's coming up to Christmas. You're in military uniform. What do you think I'm going to do? But somehow, they managed to get their hands on it. Mm-hmm. Now, there is at West Point the commander, the superintendent, uh, a man named uh, Sylvanus Thayer, and there's also Great name. yeah, very good name. And there's also the uh, commandant William Worth. Um, these are names which will come up later. Um, now they are having a, they're having a, a dinner with wine, hypocrites. <laughs> And uh, that's the worst, isn't it? The bosses are saying one thing, doing another. Yeah, ah, oh, they should have shared. Otherwise, this whole mess may not may not have happened. Yeah. So while this party is happening, it's uh, on the evening of the twenty third. There are some cadets in the mess hall stealing food, getting ready for a Christmas party. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they expected to find in the mess hall. They're not going to get like Vienna sausages or anything. They just. <laughs> Um, so they're preparing for this party. Now, on the morning of the 24th, there is, uh, well, there, the party begins. It begins slowly at first. Um, there's, there's two rooms mainly that it's happening in. Uh, Davis is in one of the rooms, uh, imbibing in the eggnog. <laughs> Excellent. And, uh, really... This, well, evidently they ran out of whiskey quite quickly because um, somehow another man in the middle of this party goes back to get another gallon of whiskey from one of the taverns. Okay. Now they're rocking. Sounds like they're having a good time. <laughs> they're having a very good time. In fact, they're rocking away. And one of the uh, the division superintendents on duty at the time goes to one of these rooms at 2 a.m., And the cadets in that room are singing and dancing, including Jefferson Davis. (laughs) This is terrible behavior. Singing and dancing at Christmas. Yeah. needs to be stopped. And the superintendent yells at them and goes back to his room. Now, I I don't know what he's really expecting to happen here because they're not going to stop. And they don't stop. (laughs) There's a man named uh, Ethan Allen Hitchcock, who is a captain. He is uh, actually a faculty member at the uh, at West Point. And at 4 a.m., he's doing his little patrols, and he hears something happening in one of these rooms and goes in, finds drunken cadets. Two of them are um, really, really drunk so far as, as they're, they're lying on the floor, and the other ones are... Um, asleep. Now, these four men aren't supposed to be in this room, so he yells at them and tells them, get back to your room. They leave, and then another man, by the name of James Weems Barion, that's his his nickname, (laughs) Weems. Weems. Okay. Uh, Weems uh, thinks it's a really good idea to yell back at Hitchcock. And, uh, well... I, I can only assume that he was rebuffed because uh, Hitchcock leaves. But as a result of this uh, th- this argument, a man named Billy Murdoch uh, gets the bright idea in his head to uh, start a riot against Captain Hitchcock. Absolutely. <laughs> Just from how dare you? How dare you shut down a Christmas party? He's such a Scrooge. Yeah, I know. I mean, they're they're just these are just guys having a good time, right? It's the most wonderful time of the year. No one told him that. Yeah. Uh, so he goes back to his room to go to sleep. A- again, I-, I really don't know... Because you- you'll, hear- you'll hear this a lot in the story, is-, is people just kind of like going into these rooms saying, all right, knock it off, guys, and then going back to their rooms and going back to sleep. And it's like, surely you'd want to stick around? 
to make sure that yeah, they you, they you knock might, it off. Right, I'm confiscating this. You go over here. You go here. Right. Sort this out. Yeah. But every single time, well, just about every single time, they they come into these rooms, tell them to stop, and then go back to sleep. Now, Hitchcock does the same thing. He goes back to his room and heads to sleep. But he is awoken three separate times by knocks on his door, only to find nobody Uh, there. Classic move. Ding dong ditch. Now, he gets fed up. He goes back out into the hallways. Eventually, he he sees Jefferson Davis coming back into uh, one of these rooms. And he follows him. All all these guys, it's like they're caught red-handed. Because apparently uh, he actually yelled at a cadet to open his footlocker, uh, only to be rebuffed. <laughs> he, he's really not exercising his authority here. He's, he's no. like, you're the captain. These are cadets. I'm amazed that the, the eggnog has done, has had such a potent effect. Well, it's... These gonna... guys, so deprived that... Uh, one bit of eggnog and they're suddenly they're playing <laughs> Nicky Nocky Nine Doors they're refusing to follow instructions well let me tell you it's going to get a lot more potent <laughs> um, the, uh, because um, this riot uh, this riot idea that uh, Billy Murdoch has come up with actually kind of takes hold um, uh, basically Hitchcock leaves the room, again, after yelling at these people, and says, alright, I've had enough of this, go find a lieutenant, William Thornton. Uh, Now, Thornton has been asleep this whole time. Uh, I I don't know how he's managed to be asleep. Yeah, plugs. Yeah. (laughs) But he is, uh, Thornton is actually awoken by yelling. He exits his room and is promptly attacked by two cadets. I don't know why, because the riot is targeting Hitchcock, but I guess by this point in time, everything is out of control. In fact, one of the cadets, I I believe, actually uh, had a weapon and is put under arrest. Goodness me. This is getting serious. Yeah. Uh, So this this has all been happening in the North Barracks, by the way. Uh, The South Barracks is is actually pretty calm. Uh, But uh, apparently the word had gotten down there that there is something happening because at this time maybe that there's some eggnog available yeah there's a little bit of nog in the uh, in in west point <laughs> and uh so there's noise coming from the south barracks so thornton goes to uh goes to investigate and uh while he's heading down to the south barracks he's he's actually knocked out by another soldier or by a cadet he he's knocked out by one of the cadets who actually snuck in the uh, the the whiskey on the first day. <laughs> what are they playing at? It seems like they have a bit to drink and they've just gone feral. I I don't know. I mean, I I have a little bit of a tipple now and then, but I've never done this. Um, I, I really at this point it's 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 complete chaos. By the way, there's there's windows being broken. Damage of all kinds is is being done. At, at three point, uh, at sorry, at one point. I <laughs> got the numbers mixed up. Too much eggnog. <laughs> too, too much nog. Um, at one point, uh, three drunken cadets approach a uh, a sentinel uh, and ask for drums and a fife. Of course, yeah. You should really be asking for water, but these guys are these guys must be wanting to party all night long. I, I'm I'm pretty sure this is like. <laughs> trying to imagine a party where they're using military trumpets for the, for the music. <laughs> or the hills and or the main. <laughs> um, so, at this point, Hitchcock's room is actually attacked by several cadets, including one who uh, is actually brandishing a pistol and fires a shot into the room. And at this point, Hitchcock's had enough. Psycho. Yeah, he, he, he starts arresting cadets. And uh, he's this is this is the point when he's starting to restore order. I mean, I I would have been less lenient to begin with, but th- this is the 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 tipping point. Mm-hmm. In the chaos, some uh, some drunken cadets mistakenly hear that uh, bombardiers are going to quell the riot with heavy weaponry. <laughs> mistakenly hear? Where do you? <laughs> I don't know. 
someone's made that up. <laughs> and uh, this uh, this actually sows chaos even among those in the barracks who aren't drunk. So some of the cadets who who didn't touch a drop of it pull up their weapons and are like, "I'm not going to die in this." <laughs> now, the man I I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the story, uh, Commander Thayer, the superintendent of the entire academy, somehow has has been asleep up until 5 a.m. When he's, uh, he's woken by the sound of drums. I think I know where that might be yeah. coming from. I like to imagine these three men out in the courtyard, just drumming and blowing <laughs> away on their fife, just walking along the entire length of it, and just, they're having the most wonderful time in the world, annoying everyone. Um... And he, uh, Thayer, asks, <laughs> asks Commandant Worth, the uh, man in charge of all the cadets there, to help the situation. Now, uh, really, things start to, to calm down now. Thornton, the, uh, the man who had been knocked out earlier, he, he wakes up in a stairwell. And uh, by this point in time, uh, Reveille sounds at 6.05. Uh and I'm going to give you a quote here. Reveille sounds at 6.05, quote, Along with gunfire, the sound of glass breaking, profanity by cadets, cries of pain, and threats to academy officials. Yeah, that sounds like a, an ordered military camp. Yeah. West Point's finest. <laughs> uh, some of the soldiers keep drinking after Reveille. Uh, some of the uh, some of the drunken ones actually show up for uh, for roll call and are doing roll call while they're drunk. Um, yeah, the, uh, that the, would have been a good look. Yeah, uh, the mutiny was uh, was officially over when Cadet Captain James A. Bradford called the corps for, uh, to attention and then dismissed them after breakfast. Chapel formation took place. Uh, for about two hours, and uh, most of the cadets were still uh, recovering from uh, from their drunkenness. Oh, I'm imagining like Christmas church service. Mm. Half of the people sitting there drunk. They've been awake all night. The half, yeah, <laughs> tired, hungover. Oh. Um, this is uh, one of my my favorite things from this whole story is that, that later that day, um, Superintendent Thayer, he met with an ordnance manufacturer and, and told the manufacturer about the riot. And uh, when he asked, what are you going to do about the misconduct? Thayer said that he didn't know. Good idea. Yeah. Decisive action. Yeah. But in the end, it was determined that about 70 cadets overall took part in the riot, and uh, in the months that followed, 20 of them were court-martialed. Uh, but not including Jefferson Davis. He, he, he made it out okay. Thank goodness. Yeah, going on to do uh, many things. <laughs> yeah, let's leave it at that. Um, well, I, do you know what I... That is... Not only is there just, like... It sounds like a bunch of teenagers drinking for the first time, mm. um, which is hilarious. But also, how the the military incompetence of not being able to get a grip on <laughs> some eggnog-infused cadets. I, they really had so many opportunities to squish this before it went out of hand. They why didn't they confiscate the eggnog? Why didn't that would be at a, 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 a first step, I would say. Why didn't the captain say, "No, you're not going to hide behind or hide in front of that footlocker. Open it and give me the bottle of whiskey that's inside. Press your authority." Do you know what I'd love to imagine? Mm. I'd love to imagine eggnog riot conditions on board the Russian Pacific Squadron on oh. its way to. Tsushima. Well, of course, um, they uh, they they did. Didn't they break in to the uh, the captain's office demanding vodka? Yeah, on their way home. Yeah, yeah. Oh, do you know what would be amazing? Mm. Mad Dog Rosetvetsky 
in charge at West Point that night. <laughs> I feel like the results would be pretty similar, although maybe there might be more broken windows. <laughs> he would call a firing exercise for six hours in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> With these drunken soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> There'd be like four casualties. <laughs> no targets hit. <laughs> Uh, Reports of Japanese torpedo boats. <laughs> uh, very true. <laughs> very true. Oh, well, that was a... Th- I'm going to enjoy my eggnog and script. Yeah, so am I. I might skip, skimp on the uh, the alcohol, though. I don't know. I don't want to end up like, uh, like Jefferson Davis and his uh, comrades. Can you imagine a holy fool on eggnog? Oh, man, think about that. I mean, he wouldn't have to have much uh, to, to go even more wild. But, uh, yeah, think about that. Throwing nuts at, like, mock speed. <laughs> All I can say is it is bloody lucky that the dogheads never discovered eggnog. Very true. Very, very true. But we are not done yet. We have a little little extra treat for you. We're, we're going to be discussing, well, you know, mentioning some names of some books that we've picked up over the last couple of weeks uh, and just throwing some names out there in case any of our listeners might want to pick some of them up or, you know, give some of them as gifts for Christmas. Yeah, little sort of stocking filler mm. ideas. Um, just kind of... One or two history um, books, films, programs that we've kind of seen in recent times or read in recent times, and things that potentially our listeners might uh, want to ask for for Christmas or or get with their Christmas money. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Maybe we should start with um, if you enjoyed the stories today about the. Um, about the Byzantine religious uh, practices. I, I owe those stories to um, a little book called A Cabinet of Byzantine Curiosities by Anthony Cal- Caldellus, which I actually got as a stocking filler last year, mm. um, which is full of just little stories um, about bizarre things in uh, the medieval Byzantine Empire, and I really couldn't recommend it highly enough. It's... Um, covers all sorts of topics um, from kind of religion as we heard but also like um, I don't know marital relations science um, scandals crime and punishment all sorts of like bizarre and funny stories mm. yeah, and there's a lot of them <laughs> yeah I haven't read I haven't read the book but uh, I, I do want to find a copy somewhere <laughs> just to hear stuff like this it's subtitled Strange Tales and Surprising Facts from History's Most Orthodox Empire. Mm. I didn't realize it had History's Most. History, in there. hey, there you go. Nice. Little plug. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, I've i picked up um, a few books here. Um, I have a bad habit of picking up books, and uh, because I get a, a, quite a lot of them at, at once, I, uh, I don't get very far into many of them. Uh, very bad habit. I I'm need very to re- guilty of that as well. Redact it. Uh, but one of them that I have is uh, one that I find very interesting. It's called uh, Forgotten Ally, uh, China's World War from 1937 to 1945 by... Um, it's a professor at Oxford of... Uh, I think it's History of uh, Modern China named uh, Rana Mitter. And uh, I picked this up about a month ago and I've been getting through it. And it's it's really good. It, it it gets deep into the details of the Second Sino-Japanese War, but it also talks a lot about China in the run-up to that and Japan as well. And it it gives a lot of in-depth details about all the people involved. A lot of the names like uh, Sun Yat-sen and uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, so many others as well. I I really like it. And uh, to anyone who's interested in like you know, Second Sino-Japanese War and uh, 
that whole World War Two more generally. Yeah, as well. yeah, it's, World War Two as well. Isn't it? Well, yeah, that's the. I guess that's the the, the whole thing. A forgotten oh, yeah. ally. Um, it really does talk about how China's contributions to the war have kind of been overlooked in the in the past couple of years, and I, I think that's I think that's pretty true. Yeah, I think potentially in the new year we're we're thinking about doing an episode covering part of um, part of that conflict anyway. Yeah. Um, a book recommendation as well from me. Um, Alistair Horne is is pretty old school. Um, he started writing in the sixties, um, mm. but he is. Um, what he is is he's a fantastic storyteller. Mm. Um, the first book I read by him was called *Price of Glory*, an account. It's um, an account of the Battle of Verdun, and it was just um, really extremely well written and and took you on a took you on a journey, a horrible, horrific journey. Um, but really great use of kind of both eyewitness accounts, but also kind of weaving and storytelling himself um the reason i bring it up is if if listeners were interested in um our second and third episodes on the uh russo japanese war um he covers that in a book he wrote called um hubris mm. uh, i think it's, he wrote it in his most recent book and he, he covers a whole load of kind of episodes of the 20th century of, of military hubris and one of them is the uh the Russian fleet's oh, yeah. journey to the the Far East um, that we kind of covered. If you want to know more about that story, he writes an excellent account of it. But he takes a number of kind of battles and uh, disasters of the 20th century and kind of usually applies his excellent kind of storytelling. Yeah, that's yeah. I wanted to find a find a copy of that um, because it, it there is quite a lot of cases quite similar in. In tone, I suppose, to the uh, Russo-Japanese War, in that book, uh, very interesting stuff. I've got one uh, book recommendation from mm -hmm. a fellow podcaster, um, Dan oh, Carlin. Yeah. Who's he? <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan Carlin of of Hardcore History fame. He recently wrote a book. Um, if you're following him on Twitter, I'm sure you know about it, but I think it's still worth mentioning because it is very good. Uh, it's called The End is Always Near, subtitled Apocalyptic Moments from the Bronze Age Collapse to Nuclear Near Misses. And it's it has a very interesting perspective in the way that the title suggests the end is always near. We've, we've been, we've had near apocalyptic events before, and we will have them again. It's uh, a scary thought, isn't it? It is. Um, How are people going to access history's most <laughs> we'll we'll back up all of our stuff on like edison <laughs> wax cylinder and lock them far in a bunker we'll put it on cassette tape <laughs> <laughs> we'll lock them in a bunker far underneath the uh underneath the earth um my favorite thing about this book is uh that it reads like an episode of, of hardcore history um, mm. And he's also done an audiobook. Uh, I, was, I was about to say, where he, you know, yeah. has he recorded this? He, he has, so it's like an extra long episode of Hardcore History, which isn't saying much because they can go on for like six hours, but I extra love that. Extra long episode, just the six months in length. <laughs> I love it, though, so highly recommended. It's nearly as long as ours, first episode. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we kind of went off the chain a little bit there. Um. I also thought we could mention a few kind of historical um, TV programs or films, things like that, mm. um, that maybe would be a great gift or something to treat yourself with this um, this Christmas. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of um, German series. Mm. Um, the first one I've been watching most recently uh, is called Babylon Berlin mm. um, which is a detective series set in late 20s um, Weimar Germany and Berlin obviously and if you like kind of um, interwar years the 20s you know 
jazz age but with a real kind of dark side um, then I definitely recommend it there's all the kind of politics and intrigue of, of Weimar Germany and kind of rise of the political extremes at that time too mm. um, I would say with that is that um, the first series it finished and I was a bit like but there's all these threads to the story and it's not even kind of tied them up but luckily the second series literally starts like an hour after the end oh, of good. Um, the first series so I'm, I'm working my way through that and intrigued to see how they managed to kind of conclude all these different storylines which are all kind of interlinked and the other one um, is a little bit different in tone it's um, and setting um TV series called Deutschland 83 and then a sequel Deutschland 86 which is set in the Cold War um, in East Germany, the DDR mm. and um, a young um, border guard is smuggled into West Germany as a spy he's basically given the identity of um, someone in the West German military uh, who is taken out and they basically change all his documents um, so he looks like this guy and it is um, it is got the kind of tension and thriller aspect um, of kind of a I don't know a 24 um, but also it's mm. absolutely rich in just kind of wry humour and um, style It's I mean it's very kind of 80s stylish kind of drama and it's it's a lot of fun Good. it's a lot of fun I'll have to give them, a, give them a try then I've been meaning to watch Babylon Berlin um, and I, I, I know you're a big fan of uh, the Weimar Republic and uh, yeah. that whole period of time and uh, so am I and I, I really want to watch it a historical show for me uh, is one I, I watched uh, about a year ago now I think and uh, it's called Shogun, mm -hmm. and it's set in Japan in about the uh, 1600s, and it's, it's it's based on a true story. Actually, it's about a uh, guy. It, they changed the name in the uh, in the show uh, from William Adams, who's the real man, to uh, William Blackthorne. But uh, it's it's about a guy named William Blackthorne who ends up in Japan in the 1600s, and wow. becomes embroiled in the local, you know, power struggle between uh, a character based on uh, Oda uh, Nobunaga, one of the unifiers of Japan at the time, and uh, also it's got an interesting dynamic because it also involves the, uh, the the Portuguese Jesuits that were present yeah. in uh, in Japan kind of doing missionary work, weren't they? Yeah, uh, so it really is a really interesting and, and unique. Uh, show it go it, it things from the Maybe 80s they were looking for dog heads <laughs> uh, i wonder <laughs> they, they may have been surprised when they made it there oh sounds good and one of those um parts of history that gets a bit overlooked again which yeah is what we love um one thing i think we've both seen by the way um that would be a film recommendation um they shall not grow old oh Delightful, such fantastic, a good film. fantastic film. It's a documentary um, by um, Peter Jackson. Yeah, and um, it takes a huge amount of First World War footage, slows it down to proper speed because, of course, people in those films move way too fast, mm. um, and importantly, has colorized it. You know, I think they've done a much more comprehensive job than a lot of. You see, you know, there's like World or Two in color and things like that. This is on a level that I would say I haven't seen before in terms of the attention to detail and the, the realism of it. Yeah. Uh, Crucially, as well, they've added sound mm -hmm. um, through lip reading and various recorded effects from from contemporary weapons and things like that. And, it just brings the conflict, the First World War, we should have said, um, to life in a way that I've never seen before. Absolutely. 
the amount of detail that went into that film is so stunning. Not only in the colorization and how stark it looks, because of, because it's they've increased the resolution so that it's actually HD, but also the like you say the amount of detail that went into the sound. There there are some. I remember there's one bit in that in that film where they have footage of a officer reading from a letter and they're trying to sync up they're trying to lip read and uh what they actually did was they went back into the archives and they managed to find the exact piece of paper that he was reading from as well as that they match up uniforms and apply the regional dialects of of english that you would get yeah. at the time, and that's such a such an important detail, and it adds so much to it. Yeah, so different regiments from different parts of the country, they got voice actors um, to, to match up, mm-hmm. and that that just kind of speaks to how you're probably not going to see anything like this, you know, ever again in terms of that amount of faithful kind of research to portray the first world war as close to how it really was yeah as it as it as it was i'll tell you one thing that really struck me um watching that film um it came out last year it's obviously available i think i I think it's coming back into cinemas at least in america i'm I'm not sure about england but i think it's coming back into cinemas over here um one thing that really struck me was with the colour and the sound and the the resolution how frightening First World War artillery was Mm -hmm. like there's one bit where they're with these gunners firing their guns and the houses in the background of the shot you can see the tiles falling off, the roofs slipping off from the shock waves of it just firing, never mind exploding yeah and the the audio again is so important because they you really get that sense yeah and this is why I think you should view it in theaters if you get the chance because mm-hmm. the sound oh, definitely is so important that. oh man the 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 boominess of you you it's it, it's a it's a sight to behold and a sound to behold as well absolutely well there you go if you get um the history lover in your life. <laughs> Cabinet of Persons and Curiosities, um, Shogun, Forgotten Ally, an Alistair Horn book, and <laughs> Babylon Berlin, Deutschland 83, They Shall Not Grow Old, then they will be, they will love you for the rest of their life. Or if that's you, treat yourself. Yeah. Treat yourself. It's the end of the year. See off those January blues. <laughs> And also, speaking of January and the next year, you have got a book coming out, haven't you? Yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, um, yeah, in January, uh, my first history book is coming out. I'm kind of becoming a historian. Oh, so, um, exciting. <laughs> yeah, um, it's called... The People's Army in the Spanish Civil War, a military history of the Republic and international brigades. Um, My specialism is kind of the Spanish Civil War, certainly the interwar years Mm. um, in Europe, particularly the Spanish Civil War. And I've written a military account of the Spanish Civil War from the point of view of the um, Republicans. Um, Next year, we're going to do some episodes about Spain and the Civil War yeah. um, which are going to set up the background but yeah if you kind of like <laughs> history's most um, we've kind of focused a lot on military history haven't we? Yeah um, we have so far. Yeah, We will kind of diversify it a bit I think in the coming months um, but if you kind of like military history and stories of bravery and incompetence <laughs> then um, I think you'll really um, hopefully enjoy this so that might be something to uh, save up for as well it's published by um, a history publisher called Pen and Sword and back end of January it will be uh, released so that is very exciting very, for me very exciting yeah I'm looking forward to reading it 
And uh, there'll be a link for that in the description of the episode if you want to pick it up when it comes out. Yeah, I mean, I would be really grateful, <laughs> um, and it would help this podcast to keep going. Um, so, yeah, it'd be lovely if you could um, support us that way. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, it's been very very fun talking to you, um, as always. Yeah, um, I always suspect at the end of each episode we've had more fun than the listeners. <laughs> um, maybe, but you know, I hope you've enjoyed some of it. Yeah, hopefully. Um, and if uh, if you have, let us know at uh, our email address, which is histories dot most at gmail dot com. Uh, or on Twitter at History's Most. Absolutely. Um, so we will see you in the new year. Indeed. From History's Most, I've been Peter. And I've been Alex. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Woo! Don't drink too much eggnog. Please. Please do. <laughs>